If you listen to our podcast, you know I am a big fan of games in the Arkham Horror universe. I have so many games on my shelf in that universe, including Arkham Horror the board game, Eldritch Horror, Mansions of Madness, and most of the cards from Arkham Horror the card game. I just really enjoy playing games in that setting with its interesting locations, characters, uncanny horrors, and cosmic entities. So naturally, when I heard about Edge Studios releasing a role-playing game in the Arkham Horror mythos, it's something I really wanted to check out. Now, before I talk about the RPG, I want to mention a couple things. If you aren't familiar with the Arkham Horror lore, it's based on the writings of H.P. Lovecraft. This was an author in the early 1900s who had many works revolving around cosmic horrors. His stories were typically set in and around the town of Arkham, Massachusetts. They contained tales of ancient gods, beings from other dimensions, lost cultures, forbidden books, and incipient madness. Lore of Arkham Horror has taken some of those themes and expanded upon them with new characters, settings, mystical objects, and unworldly creatures. Second thing I wanted to mention was, while I have played many RPGs, most of my time is spent playing board games and card games. So I'm going to approach the setting and rules of this RPG from a board gamer's perspective. With that out of the way, let's dive right into the book. Right off the bat, the art is top notch. Arkham Horror board and card games have always had great art. There is a certain style to it that is consistent in all the games and that remains here. The book itself is 256 pages and broken up into eight chapters covering the lore of the world, rules, character creation, equipment, game master tips, ancient ones descriptions, allies and enemies, and a pre-written five scene scenario. Now the thing I was most interested in in this RPG were the rules. And the RPG uses a dynamic pool system or DPS. Each player starts out with a maximum of six D6s in their pool of dice that they spend to take actions and make tests. And these pools will refill at the start of a scene or a character's turn. In addition, when the character is hurt, the pool gets smaller, thus limiting the number of actions you can take on your turn. If the pool is reduced to zero, then you're wounded, and thus the pool will not refill until you're healed. So not only are the dice used for taking actions on your turn, it's also your health pool. I'll come back and talk more about how the dice work in a bit, but first I want to focus on the character skills. They have a range from 6 plus, which is really bad, to 2 plus, which is phenomenal. Each character has 10 skills, including agility, athletics, which is strength and toughness, Wits, which is cleverness, presence, which is charm or charisma, intuition, knowledge, resolve, which is mental fortitude, melee combat, range combat, and lore, which is the measurement of knowledge of mystical legends and spell casting. All right, now let's get back to the dice pool, which will be used for actions and for skill checks against the character's skills. There are three types of actions. A simple action is where you just simply spend a die and take an action like move, pick up an object, reload a weapon, it's an automatic pass, you don't have to roll or anything. However, there is another type of action called a complex action, and those types of actions can actually fail. So when you're gonna take one of those actions, you're gonna choose the number of dice you want to roll against a particular skill. And if any of those die meets or exceeds that skill level, then you've succeeded on your test. The third action is a reaction. This is when you react to another character's action, which is done by spending one die and making a roll. Now this could be for something like, for example, trying to dodge a ranged attack, trying to block a melee attack, or see if somebody's lying. In Arkham Horror, there are two types of scenes, narrative and structured. Narrative scenes are the storytelling elements of the game. They're in these types of scenes, you don't need to spend any dice for any simple action. However, complex actions will work the exact same way. Dice pools will refill at the beginning of a narrative scene, and a narrative scene can end in one of three ways. All players have used all their dice, which encourages everyone to participate in this type of scene. Players decide they have done all they want to do, or the GM ends the scene. Now, structured scenes are the ones where the passage of time matters, and a good example of this is combat. Structured scenes go in a round where all investigators and adversaries take a turn. Dice can be used for simple actions or complex actions. Once everybody has taken action, another round begins and a player's pool will refill at the beginning of their turn. When going over skills earlier, I didn't mention initiative. That's because there's no initiative roles in this game. Instead, whichever side initiates the conflict gets to go first. All right, so this is a good time to mention how combat works. A player's gonna to decide to either make a ranged attack or a melee attack. Then you're gonna pick the number of dice you want to spend for that attack, make the roll, and all you need is one success. Now there are some attacks which are gonna be more difficult. In that situation, the GM may say, for this particular attack, you need to get maybe two successes in order to succeed. 
So if an attack is successful, then the damage is dealt based on the weapon stats. One die is removed for each point of damage. If a pool is reduced to zero, then a character is wounded and their dice pool will not refill. Now some weapons can cause an injury. If this happens, the damage character rolls 1d6 and resolves the result on an injury table, which could result in a concussion, injured arm, leg, or even death. But if you take some damage or injuries, don't worry, there is a way you can heal. You can either rest, sleep, take some medicine, another character could perform a complex healing action, and then you're going to refill your dice pool by the number of points you heal by. Now, if you've ever played any other Arkham Horror game, you know physical damage isn't the only thing a character has to worry about. There are also horrors. These are cosmic terrors that can affect the mind. There are certain situations in the RPG that can inflict a horror on the player. When this happens, they increase their horror dice by the amount of the horror they took. What are horror dice? Well, these are dice that replace the existing dice in your pool. Typically, you use a different color to indicate which one are horror dice. The difference is, when you roll a 1, they can't be re-rolled, and if you roll a 1, you may inflict trauma. When taking trauma, a player rolls a d6 and compares it to a trauma table, which could result in being shocked, stunned, or lost forever into the void. Now, horror can be healed through complex actions such as introspection or counseling, but trauma can never be healed. Okay, that wraps up the overview of the dynamic pool system. As a board gamer, I really think I'm going to like this system. I'm very used to playing games where you have a limited number of actions that you can take, and the number of actions I can take is based on the amount of dice that I have. And with the two types of actions, simple and complex, I know that I'll be divvying up those between one die for simple or multiple for complex, and that's where the push your luck comes in. Because when taking a complex action, I can decide how many dice I want to roll. Do I really want to make sure that I succeed at this? If so, I'll roll more dice. But that means I'm going to have less dice to use during the rest of the scene because I have less to spend for other actions. I think this is going to make for some really interesting decisions during gameplay. I do see a potential downside though. You know, in most other role playing games, when you do a check, like Pathfinder, you're going to pick up a d20, roll it, put in a modifier, and say, here's the result. Here, when you're making something like a complex action, you're going to spend a few seconds trying to decide, well, how many dice do I want to roll? And how many do I want to save for a future turn? You know, it's going to take a few seconds to decide what you want to do. Well, if everybody's doing that, all those seconds are going to add up over time to possibly making a little bit longer scene than what you would in other systems. So that might be a turnoff to some players, but I'm interested to see how it works for myself. So another aspect about role playing games is character creation. So let's see how that works here. With the Arkham Horror RPG, you're going to have a character where you pick a name, develop your backstory, then you pick a personality trait, such as ambitious, analytical, outgoing, etc. Each of these traits has a positive and negative side to them. Positive sides allow a player to spend insight for some sort of ability or boon. So what is insight? Insight is another resource that players have, which is like a combination of luck, intuition, and drive. At the beginning of each session, you're going to gain insight that matches your limit, and then you can spend that during the game, one of those being spending an insight to use the positive side of your personality trait. They can also be spent during the game to add successes to a complex action, maybe gain clues to solve a puzzle, or avoid triggering the negative side of their personality trait that a trauma could trigger. Also, a player can permanently decrease their insight max by two to avoid permanent death. Okay, after a personality trait is chosen, then the player is going to pick their archetype. These are analogous to classes in other games like warrior, rogue, wizard, etc. Each archetype has four types of knacks or abilities that they can use and learn during the game. Now there are eight archetypes overall, including adventurer, believer, guardian, hunter, mystic, rogue, seeker, and survivor. Now, if you've ever played Arkham Horror the card game, Many of those will sound familiar like Guardian, Seeker, Mystic, etc. as they're taken directly from that game. Once you've selected an archetype, then it's time to set your starting skill levels. Every skill starts at 6+, plus, then you can pick 3 to improve to 5+, plus, and then one additional skill to improve to 4+. Plus. Now you select one tier knack or ability. You get $50 to use towards starting gear, which includes weapons, protective gear, medicine kits, lock picks, etc. And your insight limit is set to one. Then you get to choose one of three options. Get an additional $100 to go towards gear, increase your insight limit to two, or get five experience points to immediately use to advance your character. So now is a good time to explain how character advancement works. 
While you're playing the game, you're going to get XP and you can use those points to improve your skills. For example, you can spend 2 XP to improve your 6 plus to a 5 plus or 4 XP to improve from a 5 plus to a 4 plus. There are options to improve some skills to 3 plus or 2 plus, but those are set by your archetype. So when you're making a character, you might want to decide what skills you want to really be good at, then pick the archetype that allows you to get really good at those particular skills. XP can also be used to purchase additional knacks with tier ones costing three XP and increasing cost up to tier four, which costs 15 XP. At higher levels, you can multi-class. At the cost of 125 XP, you can pick a second archetype and increase your die pool limit by one or stay within the same archetype and increase your die pool limit by two. So as you play, you'll gain XP to spend and additional money to use during the game on gear, etc. With this being Arkham Horror, players will have to deal with magic and mysticism. You may come across a tome that gives you access to spells. The book goes into detail on different types of tomes and spells that can be cast from them. But be careful, these complex actions may require multiple successes and if you fail, well, bah, a little bit of horror never hurt anybody. You've gotten the basic gameplay down and you've created a character and you're ready to start playing. The rest of the book is full of information that can be used by players and the GM. In fact, there is a dedicated chapter for the GM to give tips and guidance in running a game. There are chapters on locations, allies, enemies, and the ancient ones. I like how the book uses beige background pages except for the chapter on the ancient ones. The background there looks like a dimly lit night sky really nice touch and finally the book wraps up with the five scenario introductory campaign to help you learn the game and get up and running personally i'm really excited for the game i really like the dynamic pool system because as a board gamer i like the concept of having a limited number of actions and i can spend those actions how i want do i save up actions for the future do i risk rolling a lot of dice now knowing that i have fewer actions later but i want to guarantee that success so i really am going to get into how that works Plus, as a longtime player of other Arkham Horror themes, I look forward to immersing myself in a world where I can visit Miskatonic University. Check out a book from Daisy Walker from the Orn Library. Have a drink at the nightclub. Try to outwit Carl Sanford and go toe to toe with the Shogoth. But I would love to hear from a couple different groups down in the comments. Those who play a lot of board games, those who play a lot of RPGs. What do you think about the dynamic pool system? Is it something you're interested in? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Let me know and we'll discuss. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to this channel for all of our podcast episodes and any upcoming videos.